the first session today we'll look at foreign investments versus the local market of course it's a big debate uh, for South Africans uh, do I take my money offshore and I think most people will say yes I need some exposure offshore the question is just how much where do I invest and what do I invest in and uh, how does that fit into a diversified portfolio and hopefully we can ventilate uh, the key issues of this debate today, um, I don't think it's an either-or debate, and uh, we have uh, Shello Giose, he's from the First Avenue Investments, uh, a truly professional, has been in the business since 1993. Um, and uh, joining us, I believe, from Turkey, and I believe on a boat, but Magda Vizitska from Signia, I don't think uh, you are on a boat this morning. Uh, just tell us where you are and, uh, and, and where you are. Well, actually, no, it's not quite the boat in Turkey. It's Lake Como in Italy, <laughs> my husband's 60th birthday. Well, thank you so much for, for making time for us uh, today. And uh, I think I'm looking forward to this fascinating discussion. But uh, Magda, let's kick off with you. Um, uh, what is your, uh, you know, if you're a South African, let's take myself as an example. I'm in my 40s, uh, I am not thinking about retirement at all, but I'm worried that one day I need to have uh, sufficient money uh, and capital to allow me to, you know, enjoy maybe also going to Italy once in a while. Um, how, how should I especially consider my, the, the construction of my portfolio? How much should be offshore? How much should be in South Africa? Uh, because, of, of course, I, I want to, to end my, or have my, last days in South Africa. I've got no plans to go anywhere else. Uh, right, well, um, thank you for inviting me and welcome to everyone listening. Uh, look, in terms of uh, investment perspective, I always like to take a macro view. You know, I don't analyze individual stocks. As you know, Signia is a passive manager. So basically what we do is we analyze macro. And if one looks over the longer term, because that is really what you are looking at, you know, the, the short term noises of a war in Ukraine or pandemics of this world are short term noises. But, you know, from my perspective, a long term investment looks as follows, you know, and again, depending on which age bracket you are in, and that might very well dictate how much equity exposure you want to have. But I would maximize my offshore exposure at all times and i will take you know i would take that 45 percent that we have been allowed if uh, you know if it's pre-retirement savings i would always have it offshore i would always have it in equities i would always have it in a very well diversified portfolio of offshore equities and by that i mean a broad sector allocation broad geographical allocation um, simply because you know, you don't want to, for instance, invest all your money in SAP 500, which is made up of tech stocks. 25% of S&P 500 is tech stock, U.S. tech stocks. So well diversified offshore equity uh, portfolio to the maximum that you possibly can. I'll, I'll explain that in a second. And then in South Africa, I would invest in, given you know how high our bond yields are and how high they are likely to remain given the fiscal um, and economic position of South Africa. I would split my money, you know, between bonds and some South African equities. Now, you know, what I'm talking about is not being excited about South African equity investments as a long-term, you know, in investment um, option. And, you know, you only have to look at, and again, going down to basics, the economy of South Africa, the lack of growth, increasing unemployment, um, high inflation. We are looking at um, infrastructure problems, increasing infrastructure problems, not only electricity, but transport, uh, which means that you know, our resource companies are under pressure in, to in terms of exports. And to be perfectly honest, I don't see how South African equities represent great long-term value for investors as it stands at the moment. Unless, you know, something miraculous happens, ANC waves a magic wand, which they don't have, and fix all the problems of, in the country 
which they want. Uh, so, you know, and, and then the only additional investment I actually hold in my portfolio because that is how I manage my money. You know, I never talk about things I don't do. I also have exposure to unlisted alternative investments offshore, not in South Africa. It's not a huge percentage of my portfolio, it's around 10%. Uh, but what it does give me is exposure to the private markets. And if you actually look at the types of returns that private markets can generate. So here we are talking about private equity funds and venture capital funds. And yes, I'm biased. I started at a venture capital fund in London, but you know, I start products which I don't think have merit. Um, I would have some exposure to the private investments simply because um, they do offer a completely diversified market and correlated exposure in a portfolio. I want to invite uh, viewers to uh, send questions to events at moneyweb.co.za or if you watch on YouTube, uh, use that chat uh, function and, and ask questions uh, and I will put it to the panel. Shalo, Magda's not very positive about uh, South African equities especially. She believes in international equity. Uh, you know, exposure would uh, you know, suit uh, most investors better. What are your views? Yeah. It's, it's, it's hard to, to be positive about South Africa, um, but it's never been easy to be positive about South Africa since uh, 1900. It hasn't been positive about, it's been difficult to be positive about South Africa. If you look at that time frame though, since 1900 till say 2010 to 2011, South Africa has been the second best performing stock market in the whole world in dollar terms, in real terms. So adjusted for all the things that Meg just talking about, inflation, adjusted for currency movement in real terms, in dollar terms. South Africa has been the second best performing stock market <coughs> um, compared to 19 developed stock markets. So you take the United States, Switzerland, Australia, uh, Australia is in there, uh, Germany, Italy, France, United Kingdom, and so on and so forth, right? So these are liquid, um, diversified and investable stock markets that have driven the MSCI MIC, world. South Africa has been the second best performing stock market. What have we had since 1900? We've had all sorts of things in South Africa. I don't need to tell you, we've had Atari history, we've had civil unrest, we've had a revolution, we've had you know, very strange financial architecture, the financial rand, the commercial rand. We've had, the, we've had independence since then. We've had um, all sorts of global um, ruptions, ruptions. We've had the 1998 um, emerging market crisis. We've had the 2001 uh, tech bubble. We've had the 2008 bubble. In all of that, the South African stock market has done phenomenally, phenomenally well. So South Africa does have a role to play, South African equities, that is, do have a role to play in, 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 in the construct of one's portfolio for wealth generation. In no small part, this has happened because South Africa has commodities that participate in global growth. But in no small part, South Africa has phenomenal management companies that are really focused on capital allocation, not building over capacity, unlike Chinese management companies who build capacity, like Japanese, they build capacity. They oversupply the economy with capital, with manufacturing capacity, with industrial capacity. We are deindustrializing because we're so focused on getting returns per dollar per rand invested. So we look at companies like First National Bank. It is a truly world-class bank. When I compare First National Bank, for instance, to some of the best banks in the world, MNT Bank, uh, Wells Fargo, uh, Goldman Sachs, um, State Street, First, First National Bank is bar none the better in that cohort. So I'm not comparing it to emerging market banks, not by any chance. When I compare, for instance, clicks to its cohorts around the world in health and beauty, clicks bar none, better than, better than um, Scripps, better than CVS, better than Walgreens. So you can do this in South Africa, right? And, and, and participate in some, uh, some great capital allocation that takes place. Now you always have to look at valuation, right? And say, at what point is the United States more expensive? At what point is South Africa less expensive, right? And the United States is obviously always more, not always, but structurally more expensive, perennially more expensive, than South Africa, but that's also, that also, also because the United States um, generates better returns on capital than South Africa. The United States is a more dynamic 
our economy then, South Africa, highly competitive. But the United States also does something that South African companies don't do. The amount of share buybacks, so reducing the capital outstanding. So you raise capital for investors, but then you buy some of their shares back. And this is what Warren Buffett does. He stays with companies that over time have a shrinking share base. So he becomes a bigger and bigger, larger and larger shareholder in those companies. So South Africa has a role to play. Now, let's not forget one thing. South Africa is only about 0.8%, uh, maybe less, of global GDP, and that's shrinking. South Africa assets, financial assets are about 2% or less of global financial assets, and that's shrinking. Other countries are getting bigger and bigger, right? When I say other countries, certainly the United States, certainly Europe is getting bigger. So when you're a South African investor and you're looking to parlay your investments or your capital or your savings globally, be very mindful of the fact that there's greater opportunity in the world. I mean, when you're 2% of the world from a financial asset standpoint and you're 1% of the world or less, or 0.3% of the world actually in GDP, obviously there's great opportunity. The world is far more diversified in terms of the industry you can pursue. So when Magda talks about uh, venture capital, she's probably talking about things like biotech, which we don't have. Uh, we don't have even something as simple as an arm, arms industry, you know, which is controversial, but is a phenomenal place to be in. Mm -hmm. We don't have many industries in, in, in South Africa, so you, you shouldn't be beholden to just investing in what you know. You can have a home buyer so investing in what you know, but don't be beholden by that. What it does, um, Reich, is that it makes investing difficult, because how do you invest in sectors you don't know? How do you invest in companies you don't know? The tech industry, for instance, we don't have any here. We have NASPAS that has Tencent, but that's not South African, right? We're just a holding company that, that babysits those shares, if I can put it honestly. So there are opportunities that, that are global, that are diversified, that are wealth creating in the context of valuation. So what would I do from a, from a proportion standpoint? I would certainly put a majority of my capital offshore. I would certainly put I would say about 70% of my capital in global markets, and I certainly put 10% of my capital in South Africa, in equity markets in South Africa, but South Africa does have high yields. And no matter how bad the ANC is, no matter how bad the government is, I mean, they are determined not to go bankrupt. It's the last thing we have, actually. It's the last thing we have. We are at the last end of whatever grace the capital markets can provide us. The government is determined not to go bankrupt. So high yields in South Africa are really worth it. So South African bonds do have a role to play. Is the biggest risk for investments a political risk in South Africa, especially for the local market? You know, political risk, but I would have to say also, um, I'd have to say also the lack of dynamism. I think maybe legislative creativity. We just don't know how to grow the economy. I think, in, in essence, we're state-driven, state so it's a political risk. It's a political risk if you, if you look at it that way in, in general terms. You know, not political in the sense of that you know, we're, about to, we're about to you know, kill people. That's not the kind of political risk I'm talking about. I'm talking about just inadequate legislative creativity to drive the economy and lower risk. Magda, I want to come back to what you said earlier. Um, you need to have your maximum um, allocation in your portfolio offshore, which is 45%. But that is within... Uh, the retirement industry, the so-called Regulation 28 um, limitation of foreign investments. If you have a discretionary portfolio in South Africa, in addition to a, a pension fund or an RA, uh, how much of that would you invest offshore? Yeah, so I would agree that that percentage is somewhere between 60 to 70 percent. And, you know, the main reason for that is that you know, yes, there is the past and what JSC might or might not have done in the past, um, but you can't discount two factors. One is that JSC is artificially propped up by Regulation 28. So given that the vast percentage of South African savings is actually uh, trapped either in institutional retirement funds or retirement annuities, you know, you can't discount the fact that um, they are only permitted to take 45% of money offshore, which means that most domestic asset managers still focus on South African equity markets by definition. Then the other aspect of it, and they, they almost three kind of things which are, you know, w which talk to the JSC. The second one is that the number of listings on the JSC and hence investable opportunities are shrinking. 
So there are a lot more delistings that we have seen happen than we have seen listings, and that trend has is you know is not stopping. And um, the next one is the dominance of effectively NASPERS and now process on the returns of the JSC over the last decade or so. So if you strip all of those effects out, I don't think you know the JSC really does represent such a great opportunity. Now, in terms of commodities and being a commodity market, I think you have just as an attractive commodity market in Australia as you have in South Africa without having to take on all the political risk um, or the, the political incompetence, really, um, and the uh, economic risks associated with the fact that, for instance, you cannot transport and export steel at the moment because our port infrastructure has been destroyed by, uh, you know, KwaZulu Natal, Natal storms, and little has been done to maintain that infrastructure. So, irrespective of the fact that you know JSC is a little bit of a hotbed of trapped money, and domestic asset managers keep the money in South Africa, you know, if I'm a rational investor, I do want access to as broad a portfolio of opportunities as I can have. And again, it, it is the biotechs, it, it is tech, pure tech that we don't have in South Africa. There are armaments and there are other sectors that we truly do not have represented on the JSC. And you know, if I am structuring a portfolio, I want exposure to all of those sectors to the very maximum. So I would not keep more irrespective of you know the higher inflation potentially in South Africa than in other countries although you know over the short term that obviously has switched um, irrespective um, I would want to have anywhere between 60 and probably again closer to 70 uh, percent of my money offshore do you regard companies like NASPAS process AB InBev um, even maybe Sassol, Richmond, uh, which also dominate the local market, do you regard them as offshore companies? Because they earn the, Correct, the bulk of their income offshore? 100% mm -hmm. I do. That was one of my arguments for, you know, an, a pro-lifting of foreign exchange limits uh, within Regulation 28. Um, and the argument was that, you know, although there are many companies listed on the JSC, they create no jobs in South Africa or very limited jobs in South Africa. They have very limited operations, if any, in South Africa. So what you are then saying is if you look at a company like NASPERS, is what you are saying is that by investing in JSC, uh, if you want tech exposure, your sole exposure, tech exposure that you can get via the JSC is investment in Tencent, not in Alibaba, not in Microsoft, not in Amazon, it's Tencent alone. Uh, Richmond, again, luxury goods, very limited range of brands that Richmond owns. You know, so, so if you said to me, would you like exposure to multiple luxury retail companies, or would you like exposure to just a few that Richmond owns? The answer is obvious. If you ask me if you want exposure to broad tech market and all the tech companies available worldwide or do you just want to concentrate your exposure on Tencent? Again, the answer is obvious. I don't want Tencent. In fact, you know, I want a very split, split between Chinese tech and US tech exposure in my portfolio. And that is basically equivalent to saying I want to take my money offshore. Shlalo, interesting yeah. perspective. Sure, I, I would say, you know, it's, it's actually a little bit of a complex subject, this, because um, every country has, not every country to a certain extent, has the same weaknesses that Magda is talking about. I mean, if you look at the Spanish stock market, I can ask you, what does a Spanish stock market have to offer from a diversity standpoint or diversification standpoint? <coughs> compared to the South African stock market, right? If you're sitting in Spain, do you look at the whole Spanish stock market and say, do you know, there's really nothing here that's special. I can get the best companies in the United States. I can get the best companies, you know, 
somewhere in the Euro 60 or Euro 600 or Euro 60, but not in Spain. You can do that with the United Kingdom. I can ask you, what really does the United Kingdom have? What, stock, what particular stock that's special does the United Kingdom have? Right? If I, I, I look at Switzerland, I say, okay, maybe there are three or four companies in Switzerland that are outstanding. So, you know, there's something called comparative advantage. You're not going to have everything in every country, but you can't junk a whole country. You have to pick the best of what each country has to offer. And it's true that South Africa doesn't have all of it. The stock market in South Africa is not, does not compete at a high level compared to the rest of the world. I would have to say that the United States is really extremely broad and extremely diverse. It gives you a wide variety of sectors that you can pick. And, it's, and, and the United States presents that opportunity to not just South African investors, but to European investors, you know, Spanish, Turkish, you know, you know, Portuguese, and so on. Because what does a Portuguese stock market have? If I ask you, tell me one good stock in the stock, Portuguese stock market. Tell me one good stock in the, in the Italian stock market, maybe SLO like Luxottica, right? Um, so this is the point that you're trying to make here is, is that each country has its own sorts of ills, but you can't junk each country because of those ills. Each country has a plethora, no, not even plethora, a sprinkling of opportunities. And, and, and it's true what Magda's saying is that why buy a rich here? You can buy it in Switzerland. Why buy an Espresso? You can buy Tencent, right? But I just mentioned earlier that when you look at the world, you might say, well, I'm going to buy Clicks in South Africa. I'm going to buy Discam in South Africa. I'm going to buy Fresh Run in South Africa, right? There are some opportunities which you can find in South Africa. Now, that doesn't mean that you make up a whole portfolio with South Africa. It means that South Africa becomes part of your construct, albeit a smaller part of your construct. I, I do agree that between, I would have to say, 70 and 80 percent is what you take offshore. Um, it just makes it far more complex to do that, to, to analyze those opportunities, because once you go offshore, you're on the hands of the wolves. I mean, I ask you a question. Choose out of about 1,000 fund managers, which one is better for you? Okay, that makes it far more complex, right? And fund managers like us are vying for that opportunity. So there's a home bias in terms of looking for opportunities. There's a home bias in terms of making, look, looking for managers. But I also make one more point that I think um, Magda is getting at here, is that South Africa has an existential problem that it has to figure out. And the way I look at it is that the government really isn't interested in looking at this problem, right? <clears throat> but the problem is we have about 980 state-owned enterprises. We have about 230 listed companies. 230 listed companies drive more value in GDP than 980. We have a whole bunch of tax money that's sh being shoveled at a voracious rate towards the 980. We have companies that are on the stock market that don't benefit one penny from the taxpayer. When I say one penny, they're not funded by the taxpayer, right? They obviously drive on roads built by the government and so on. So the government builds an infrastructure, but that infrastructure is being built at a reducing rate. So these companies are looking after themselves, creating jobs, creating income, growing wages, um, growing GDP at a much faster clip than SOEs. That is the existential problem. If you could take even half of those SOEs, if you take Transnet, put on the stock market, if you had taken SAA, put on the stock market, if you had done, you get better capital allocation, those companies would be contributing to our job, job creation, co contributing towards wage growth like and Telcom so on. Like Telcom did. Like Telcom did. So this is, a, this is a lack of legislative creativity. This is a lack of adherence to what's actually working. 980 versus 230, right? And the 230 is shrinking. Yet we're sitting with the bench of 980 that is not coming on to the field, right? This is the existential problem that Mark is talking about. Because if that were the case, we might have better companies, I, not even better, we might have a diversity, a greater diversity of companies on the stock market. Like if Danelle had been on the stock market, Danelle would have, would have competed with, with um, Lockheed Martin, you know, in the States, with, Not, with Northrop Grumman, right, you know, in the States. It would have competed with, um, you know, it, it, would con it would have contributed some diversity. Yeah, and I, and I think uh, they would have been managed uh, slightly better within the, uh, you know, higher 
uh, auditing requirements and sure. JSE listing requirements, sure. which, which uh, offers a lot more transparency. It's but I think, but I see some signs, you know, the SAA, although there is maybe a, a lot of uh, concern that it should have gone bust, uh, but it's in, in private sector control at the moment. We see with Transnet, private operators will be allowed on, on railways. So maybe there's movement. I think the development state model, which the ANC and, and government has implemented not successfully, yeah. If that changes, we, we could see some of these uh, structural problems being addressed. Well, I mean, here's a bigger opportunity, right? You need to have an, an equity culture in a country, okay? I think at this point in South Africa, there's a small percentage of the population that actually takes its own discretionary money. I'm not talking about pension funds. Mm -hmm. Takes its own discretionary money, which I, I think a lot of your, your listeners, too, are, are stewards of discretionary money, to put onto the stock market as a first step. Okay, it's a lower step than to put onto the global stock market. That's a higher step, right? Now you think about it, if you were to get more and more people from the rural areas, from the townships, okay, people in remedial areas of residence, to put them onto the stock market, develop an equity culture by extending or by introducing SOEs onto the stock market. And I don't care how you do it. You know, the government owns five, ten percent at some point, but you put it on the stock market. You, you, you'd get a government that is interested in developing the stock market, interested in telling people to develop an equity culture so they can look after themselves more than the government try, wants to look after them through grants. That really would liberate the economy, grow it such that this would be a wonderful economy, let alone a stock market. Yeah. Magda, um, let's uh, talk about the exchange rate. I think many people uh, only want to invest offshore to hedge themselves against a weakening rand. Um, so what are your views on the exchange rate and how big a uh, decision or what role does it play in the decision to invest offshore or not? Like, I think it plays a significant uh, role without being the dominant factor. So, you know, the, the, just a couple of things I wanted to touch on in terms of you know, discretionary savings and individual savings um, and even, you know, financial advisor to advising individuals to save. I think too much focus as, you know, we're debating this has been placed on individual stocks. Now, 99% of the population is in no position to stock pick and select the companies they want to invest in. And even if they feel they are, they shouldn't feel that. Most people are ill-equipped to select companies, you know, and the best advice that you can give to investors uh, domestically or internationally, incidentally, is to actually invest in broad-based index tracking funds at low cost, broad exposure, without having to select any stocks, which frankly, if you are holding a day job, which doesn't involve stock analysis, then frankly, you have no space selecting stocks. So it's very foolish to think that, that you've got some extraordinary powers to select the stocks that will outperform. So that's it. that is my one point. Now, the second point is currency. And obviously the currency um, is a function of flows of money in and out of the country. And, you know, the rent suffers from two issues. One is, and, and it's a big one, is that we have one of the most liquid emerging markets currencies in the world, which basically means that foreign investors, when they invest you know, on basis of sentiment, like South Africa, because they can buy and sell, you know, there are no restrictions and no liquidity constraints on how quickly they can exit the market, which is why you see quite a lot of volatility in our currency. Now, what has propped up the rent to date is a high yield. So foreign investors, you know, in a world of almost zero, if not negative interest rates offshore, are attracted to South Africa um, simply because we pay such high interest rates on our debt. Now, that is a double-edged sword. Why are we paying such high interest rates on our debt? Well, it's because we have failing infrastructure, um, a government which doesn't have credible economic policies on the table. Even if we had these policies, we have absolutely no implementation cap capabilities, as we have seen. And, you know, I am still to see a reverse of that. So, you know, 
you don't have to be a genius to open a newspaper every single day to see kind of one negative story after another emerging out of the public sector in terms of how the economy, the municipalities are being mismanaged. Um, you know, as a consequence, you know, is there a world where we could see in the short to medium term the rent appreciating and hence domestic investments being more attractive simply because of the currency strength? And frankly, apart from are interest rates edging a little bit higher, not too much because that would signal potential for default, uh, but are interest rates edging a little bit higher? Yes, we will attract more investments and yes, the rent will remain at the level at which it is right now. But make no mistake that the investments we are attracting has have nothing to do with um, long-term infrastructure-based investments are ones that are creating jobs. It's hot money coming in and out of South Africa. So any further reversal in sentiment in terms of, you know, any more negative data points emerging out of the country will result in money again flowing out and the currency depreciating and you are better having your money offshore. And I think when people think about offshore investments, right, you're quite right. The, for, you know, the, the foremost thing on the minds is not diversification away from the commodities on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange or exposure to different sectors. It actually is the fear of further currency depreciation. And look, we've been through a lot. If you actually think back 10 years and um, you know the rent being closer to Eight rent to the dollar. We are now looking at 15 to 16 rent to the dollar. You know, one needs to ask oneself a question. What would need to happen in South Africa to ensure that the rent doesn't go to 20 rent to the dollar and in time 25? And obviously, there are theoretical things that could happen. You know, there could be good economic policies on the table. There could be government eventually coming to its senses and rather than protecting trade unions, um, actually privatizing SOEs or at least partly privatizing SOEs um, and relaxing regulation. Uh, you could have um, people deciding to, because that, that's also yet another major issue which talks to growth prospects of South Africa. You could implement policies which are tax friendly to foreign investors. Uh, so tax free zones, breaks on taxation, yeah. which would again attract money to, to South Africa. You could um, introduce uh, a more vibrant venture capital industry in South Africa, which is non-existent, which would keep our young entrepreneurs in the country, which would translate into job creation. So there is a lot of things that with proper thinking and proper people around the table, you could implement and, you know, reverse this almost inevitability if things continue along the same path as they are on at the moment of the rent continuing to depreciate. But I uh, still Mata, have can to I interrupt see you there? We've got 14 edge. minutes left. Um, I just want to quickly, uh, one of the questions is, you know, the word valuation hasn't been mentioned once today. It seems like the share values have been influenced by political uh, developments and, and prospects. Um, do you want to comment on that? What role does valuations play in your investment yeah, decision, well, local versus international? Sure. I mean, I mentioned valuation at the beginning, that, that you can look at global, global versus local all you like, but valuation is extremely critical. So you, so you pick the best uh, breed of companies as you wish, or you pick the best opportunity as you wish, you look at diversification all you wish, but you got to buy valuation. So when you look at the last five years, the United States has obviously done, not even five years, I would have to say last um, 12 years, the United States has done phenomenally well relative to the local market, right? So valuations of South Africa today versus the United States, South Africa is more appealing than the United States. Now, um, will the United States, will the valuation of the United States ever be cheaper than South Africa? No, but they'll contract, as they have contracted at this moment. At this moment, I think what's the best thing to do, the best thing to do is to allocate more capital offshore 
because valuation has become more attractive. But there was a time, certainly, say December 2021, when it would have been more prudent to put money in South Africa because of valuation. You know, that's, that's, that's really how you invest anywhere globally. You pursue valuation opportunities together with the quality of companies that you're pursuing. But I just wanted to mention one thing about, about currency, right? I mean, I, I think as South Africans, you know, we're really good about identifying what's negative, right? And we go on about that, but you can't have it both ways. The RAND is not where it is by mistake. The one good thing we have in this country, besides the tax man who's getting better at it, is fantastic monetary policy. Our, monetary, our central bank is right up there behind the Fed and behind the ECB and behind the Swiss National Bank with regard to how it's stewarding this country. If it wasn't for the Reserve Bank, um, think about how much less confidence international investors would have to even use a RAND as a proxy for emerging, for emerging markets. Our currency is about as good as it gets because we have a central bank that's about as good as it gets, right? So each currency has value and that value is driven by two things, confidence behind the central bank that's stewarding it and interest rates. Interests are not the only factor, it's confidence behind the central bank. That really, we can't have it both ways. That's really a good thing. Whether you want to take money offshore, and when you do take it offshore, you put it in a passive investment, as Magda says, is up to you. Well, we put it in an active investment, it's up to you. But either way, which passive invest investment are you going to put it in? BlackRock, Signia, or Barclays, whatever. I mean, there's so many of them, right? You are in the hands of wolves, by the way, based on valuation also, by the way. Now, there are a few questions regarding, you know, in what do you invest? I believe there are about 3,000 funds in South Africa. In the world, there probably could be 3 million funds. Um, so the investment universe is really, really uh, vast. Um, Magna, do you look at actively managed international or foreign funds in South Africa? How, how good are the local analysts and and fund managers in picking offshore uh, stocks? And, uh, or do you look, look at international active managed funds? Uh, I know you and Signia is, is really big in uh, you know, uh, exchange traded funds um, and, and index uh, trackers. Uh, so, so how would you approach it? Because I don't think there's a either or scenario, but how should we look at it here? Actually, interestingly, there isn't an either or. So, you know, I'll be controversial by saying that I don't think that South African domestically based asset managers are in any position to choose and pick stocks offshore. And, you know, one of the reasons is very simple. Our local asset managers have small investment teams. Their knowledge, by virtue of Regulation 28, is very low. So they know the Johannesburg Stock Exchange stocks very well. If you look at the thousands and thousands of stocks that are available for investment offshore, we just don't, as a domestic asset management industry, have the resources to analyze and analyze well stocks offshore. So, so that's the domestic asset managers. Now, internationally, you know, and Signia, you might have, you know, we obviously have a firm belief that passive investing is a very sensible way of investing for for. A standard average investor simply because the low cost aspect of it does translate into better returns over time. But we, as Signia, we are also multi managers, so we also do select active offshore asset managers where we come across those that have done very, very well and you know excel in a particular area. Uh, so we are not, you know, in my mindset, I'm not an exclusively passive investor. Um, and there are international companies which are, you know, and, and look, there are thousands of offshore asset managers and it is absolutely naive to suppose that you will be able to identify out of these thousands, that you'll be able to identify the one or two or three that are the best. There are many very good offshore active asset managers. Um, you know, if you do some research, you will find them, you will find active funds that have done very well. But irrespective of whether you are going active or passive, you know, my advice has always been go broad based in terms of exposure. So the bit where, 
you know, people sitting in South Africa believe that at any given point in time, they can uh, select uh, whether and, and successfully select whether they invest in technology stocks at a point in time or in mining or in value stocks or in growth stocks. You know, if you invest, it's, it's a bit of a misnomer. Again, unless your full-time job is being an asset manager. Um, if you are investing for the long term, the safest way of investing, be it passive or be it active, is to invest in managers or strategies which are diversified and they diversified across sectors and they are diversified across geographies. Uh, so for instance, you know, a very simple index tracker, whether it's managed by a Signia of this world or a BlackRock, uh, MSCI World Index gives you a very broad based exposure to the world. Okay. So and then I you can say, tilt it. I just want to say, you know, Magda, I think it's, 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 it's extremely critical of you because, you know, you've gained capability now, you're, you're able to look at global markets and, and global managers. I think it's extremely critical that Magda, you use your bully pulpit, your platform, to actually develop the local stock market, develop local managers, to be able to develop them into managing global equities, global bonds, and global asset classes. I don't think it's healthy to say South African managers can't do it, and therefore I'm gonna pick, you know, Aberdeen Asset Management. I think you, you, look at, you need to look at South African managers and say, okay, now we're coming out of Reg, 20, reg 28, 45% is gonna to turn to 50 to 55 to 60. How do we bring along the South African asset management industries that they are capable, or it is capable, to compete with an Aberdeen, with the shorters and so on and so forth. You know, it's not, I, I, don't, think it's, I don't think it's the right way to say, Dunk, junk South Africa managers, let's go to global. Because South African assets, like asset, assets around the world, do present systemic risk. You know, but how do you have systemic risk with assets sitting o o overseas? What if Aberdeen goes under and it's carrying South African money? It's extremely critical that we develop South African capabilities to manage global equities rather than to just leave them behind. The second thing that I want to mention is that I think at this point, it's really unsafe for the FSCA to increase Reg 28, or is it the Reserve Bank to increase Reg 28, well, to increase offshore allowance to 45, without thinking about an architecture like USITS. South Africa needs to now develop an architecture like USITS that determines the kind of risk that managers should take, risks that investors should, should not be um, exposed to, so that we can invest healthily abroad, no different from how the ECB has done it, no different from how the SEC has done in the United States. We don't have the use of infrastructure or architecture in South Africa. We really need that, because if we don't, then we, 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 know, we derive false comfort in the fact that use in Europe does it. What about a South African architecture that actually does it? We don't have that. <clears throat> so now you're in the hands of anybody that says, I think I can do it safely overseas. That's, that's, that's not good. Is there any okay, no, research really on, on, on whether local managers underperform international managers? I'm talking about active managers. Yeah, they, I mean, they underperform, they outperform, they do it just as well as anybody else, actually, I have to say. Um, we run a product that actually does global equity and it does well at times, it doesn't do well at other times based on style. I, but I think the greater point is this, that you know, from, from 1800 to today, the United States has had opportunity to keep money in the United States and develop its capabilities, so has Europe, so why not South Africa? Magda? Look, I mean, you know, with, with all due respect, I, I am not, um, for want of a better word, dissing South African asset managers. I think they are very good at what they do, which is invest in South African stocks. That is what, what they've been trained on. That is the portfolios that they manage today. Now, in terms of um, the international investing and developing the South African asset management industry to invest internationally, I would just like to make one point. You know, it, it kind of talks to this concept of we should uh, believe in South Africa uh, and we should create jobs in South Africa. Well, South African asset management industry has not been a job creator in South Africa. South African asset managers employ hands full of people to manage money. So investing a lot in developing of South African asset management industry in order to for them to manage money offshore is kind of neither, neither here nor there in terms of job creation in the country. 
Um, and then the other thing that you're fighting against, and that I think is a bigger problem, is, you know, a much bigger problem, is the skills drain from South Africa. So it's very well to talk about, uh, you know, upskilling. South African asset managers to manage money offshore and building up the, those capabilities. But I only have to look at my sons, and I've got, you know, 22 and a 24 year old, to tell you right now, they've obviously been educated through best schools in South Africa. They and all their friends of any color, incidentally, not only white, are leaving South Africa in droves because of lack of opportunities. So when you are talking about taking the best and the brightest and turning them into asset managers that can many manage money offshore, ideally, yes, realistically, they are on the next plane out of South Africa. So, so we've got a bigger problem. Mac, I'm going to interrupt you there. We've got a few minutes. I just want to ask a last question is, do you invest directly in funds offshore or do you invest via feeder funds in RANDs in South Africa? Uh, and um, I'll, I'll come back to Shlelo um, yeah. with a, also with a, a view on that. Um, you know what? I invest in ETFs on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. It's just so much easier. Then I don't invest in feeder funds. Feeder funds, unit trust feeder funds are typically kind of fees on fees on fees. So there are layers of fees. You can achieve exactly the same by investing in an exchange traded fund through easy equities for that matter, or any other stock broker. On the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, one layer of fees, the same offshore exposure that I can get. And then when I want to take money offshore, physically take money offshore, I only do so for the purposes of investing in asset classes I can't access in South Africa, like private equity. Yeah, I, I think she's right about feeder funds. It's, it's uh, you, you could have, you could have, you know, um, high costs to to a fund if you do that. I think, I think it. Look, the responsibility to grow your wealth is is a, is an incredible responsibility. It is complex. It's not an easy task. I think it's important that you either invest through an ETF or passive product or active product, whichever way you choose to do it. Rather do it directly than. Than through, th than through feeder funds. And I think it's, it's actually also critical that, I, I'm not gonna stop mentioning this, that South Africa has to develop its capabilities um, because it does have something to contribute from a financial um, asset standpoint, from a systemic risk standpoint. And so there have to be capabilities in South Africa that are built, whether active or passive, to, to be able to, 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 serve, um, to, to, to serve investor interests, investors' monies. Um, I think we have a few minutes. The, the session has been stretched because I think this is a fascinating debate. There are several questions regarding uh, the structure of investments locally versus offshore. We have a special session later today just covering that topic. Um, but let me uh, see here. Uh, um, uh, questions regarding the U.S. inflation rate. Of course, uh, we, we saw an inflation rate yesterday in South Africa of 6.5%. Many people thought, wow that it's a lot higher than what was expected, but we also see inflation problems elsewhere in the world, especially in the US, and, and, and that is set to continue. Obviously, that will trigger higher interest rates. Uh, Magna, does that have, uh, does, that, does that concern you? Look, it is what it is. Uh, you know, that inflation that we are seeing globally approaching eight, eight nine, ten percent in projected in the UK, for instance, is a little bit beyond our control. So a big function um, of it is obviously the war in the Ukraine, the higher oil prices and gas prices, which then translate into almost higher prices of everything, you know, higher prices of transport, higher prices of electricity, and then obviously the food issue and the food supply issue, who knew that Ukraine was the breadbasket of the world. Um, so you've got a side of this inflation which you can do nothing about um, for as long as the base effects continue. So as long as, you know, a year ago the prices were lower, then the inflation number today with higher prices will be higher. 
in a year's time when your base effect is uh, you know today's prices and next year's prices are at the same level as today's prices because there is no, no further increase in prices then inflation will start trending downwards the only other aspect of inflation is which and and that is inflation that cannot be controlled or it's very difficult con to control through interest rates and by central banks uh, because you know in order to increase in order to to tame inflation of say eight or nine percent you have to increase interest rates to above ten percent and i don't think any central bank not the fed not uh, not european central bank have any appetite for interest rates at that level now the other side of the inflation that we are seeing and that's not necessarily south africa but certainly us uh, is consumer driven inflation so there is this pent-up demand post-pandemic people going shopping wildly. But I think that in the face of the high food prices and high electricity prices, that momentum spending by consumers is very quickly coming to an end. It's still there, but it has already started trending downwards. So the reality of this inflation is that I think it's here to stay for at least the next 12 to 18 months. We just have to live through it. I don't think that interest rates, as much as you will see incremental increases in interest rates, to try and be perceived to be doing something, yeah. I don't think that those interest rates are really going to have a material impact on inflation until the base effects have kind of worked themselves out of the system. So actually, it, I think it is what it is. It doesn't worry me terribly, but I do think we are heading for potential recession in the US and definitely Europe as a consequence. Trello, interesting question. We've spoken a lot about foreign investments. Uh, you, you know, you and Magda have said, you know, 70 to 80% of your discretionary investments offshore. What about the 30%? What should you look at in the local market to go and find those stocks, the clicks, mm -hmm. the discams, uh, and the likes you've mentioned before? Well, I think Magda mentioned how good South Africa managers are with regard to picking domestic stocks as well as picking domestic bonds. I think that's what the 30% goes to. I think it's uh, stocks, bonds, property. And I think do as little as, as you can in cash. I mean, cash is, cash is feels safe at this point, uh, but I think when you look one year out, you really miss the opportunity to have bought bonds at a high yield and benefit from, uh, bond, from, from, from the bond market when, when bonds drop or yields drop and bonds go up, right? and bond prices go up, I think, you'll, I think you'll regret doing that. I think you'll also regret buying equities at this point, because if you look five years out, you'll be in a much, much different position from a noise and sentiment standpoint. So I think it's, it's really just three asset classes that, that you worry about. And, and you know, I, I know there are things like gold, and there are things like Bitcoin, and this is a retail invest, investment. I really wouldn't worry about Bitcoin. I really wouldn't worry about, you know, I would even say gold. Um, I have to say, just worry about things that are confidence driven and have an interest yield to them. So don't put it under your mattress or your cash on, in a couch. Um. Well, I mean, how much money would you have made had you done that, say, in, not, well, when we were in Shopville, 1967 or something? Uh, what, would you, what would you have done, you know, how much money would you have made in cash had you taken every terrible news point, political point, social disruption and put, put it into cash, you'd have lost out on a lot of money. So this conference is about wealth building. Obviously be safe from a valuation standpoint. And I'm gonna say this, it doesn't absolve you of the responsibility of seeking a good steward for your money, whether it's active or passive. Yeah. Well, I think we can speak about this topic for many, many hours, uh, but I think this was a fascinating discussion. Magda, thank you so much for talking to us all of the way from uh, Italy. Uh, it seems like a, a lovely day there. It's a cold and windy day here in Johannesburg. But thank you so much for, for your time and, and participation. Um, and as well as Slelo Giose from thank uh, First Element. Thank you so much. First for, Avenue. For the First Avenue. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> and, uh, thank you for, for your participation. Thank today. you very much for having me. Yes, and I think it's a great session. There are, I don't think there's a silver bullet on how you decide how to invest offshore. I think the key takeaway is you need to have a significant portion of your portfolio offshore. Uh, and once you're offshore, it's not the, the easiest decision. Maybe a broad uh, you know, ETF or index tracking type of approach could be.
conservative and uh, the most adequate in, in these uncertain times. Thank you so much for, for joining this session.